what I would like to suggest to everyone, because I know just from my own emotional body and self and work, et cetera, my life, that hearing this kind of news is, what do you do with that? You know, it's like it's daunting, it's beyond our comprehension, it's depressing, it's like, well, what the, you know, let's just all go swim off into the ocean, you know? But, but I do believe we can still make a difference. And, and I would encourage all of you to empower yourselves and, and, and find a way to make a difference. And we're a small group, but, but all of us know many people and have many connections in all walks of life. And we can, by talking about it, by calling people up, whether it's politicians, whether it's environmentalists, I don't know, bankers, you know, people you know, we can, we can start growing this family and, and, and make change. Um, I'll just give you a small example of in, within my own life. Um, when I met Sadutz, who's a Haida Carver, and I decided that I would quit my entire life I was an architect, I stopped doing architecture, I left Europe, I came back to America, although I did not want to come back to America, and I was determined to join forces with him to create a platform for First Nations people to have a voice to talk about taking care of Mother Earth. That was in 1997. When I first got to Seattle and we started carving canoes, we had a pocket knife and a gigantic old growth cedar tree. We built five canoes together with Seattle community. Every single event we went to where everyone served soda pop, we brought water. At the end of five years, we go to those events, everybody brought water, nobody brought soda pop. The other thing we did was we always honored First Nations people. Every time we have an opening or a ceremony, we would say, we want to honor First Nations people, we thank them for this land that we are standing upon. And now the government officials of Seattle, King County, when they have their meetings, they, what do they do? They serve water and they honor First Nations people and acknowledge them. This is just a little example, you know, but that shows that just little you and me, we can make a difference. And so please, you know, be courageous, be bold. And, and, you know, practice kindness, kindness to Mother Earth, but with, with courage. Um, so I, I really just wanted to instill that message because, you know, otherwise we're going to flounder in, in apathy and depression, but, but we can still make a difference. Even if we're not here in seven years. Like, I'm not afraid of that personally, but, but I'm going to use my life here and now until whenever it's time to go to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And I encourage everyone to come to the mic with any questions or comments you have. Let's make this a conversation. Yes, sir. Can I just ask if there's um, been any, if there's any data about how many nuclear power plants have to melt down in order to trigger this stripping of the atmosphere? To my knowledge, there is no information about that. I strongly suspect, based on what I read, that Fukushima alone is an extinction level event for humans. What would it take to strip away the atmosphere? We don't know. We haven't completed that experiment yet. <laughs> Try as we might. I, you know, the precautionary principle comes into play here. We're not extinct yet, so we still have the ability to do something. And that doing something, if we want, includes right action from a Buddhist perspective. Will it make any difference? That's why Buddhists don't remain attached to the outcome, because it might not. But I still think there's a bunch of right actions that we can take. I don't know. I think less is more. I think the fewer nuclear power plants we have melted down catastrophically and spew ionizing radiation through the atmosphere, the better. But, and, and I doubt if there's a number. I doubt if anybody would ever be able to come up with a number, it's 47. 
Uh, well, of course, unless it's Hitchhiker's Guide, then the answer is always 42. Question. Feel free to pull the microphone out. Yeah, I, I used to be a city planner, and uh, 60 years ago we all went to learn how to build uh, bomb shelters. And uh, they told us uh, eventually, forget the bomb shelters, uh, the only thing that will survive are uh, beetles, uh, cockroaches. And I was wondering, how do we teach cockroaches to read and write? Or <laughs> drive cars. I think they're better off reading and writing, frankly, because I I think that there's a wisdom in a in nature that we've lost. So I'll just leave you that thought. And so, um, so you mentioned the Pentagon, and there, and, and from what I've heard, that there's a um, there are many secrets out there that the the military is like so advanced in front of us, and, and we don't know what they have. And uh, the the honest the honest sphere, well, it, it could be like a big plasma TV. And there's a lot of stuff that, out there that we don't know about. Um, and, you know, they might have like a, a free form, of, uh, endless form of energy that they're keeping from us. Uh, they might have a way of refreezing the Arctic that we don't know about. Um, and you hear these stories about people going to, I you know, politicians and stuff going to Iceland and, uh, you know, their bunkers and stuff. And I'm just wondering, is there any truth to that? I mean, do they plan on um, going to a bunker and hanging out for a little while and, and then uh, come back and employ harp or something to refreeze the Arctic? And then, and then uh, maybe employ some other technology to, to take care of the nuclear radiation? I mean, these are just questions that I'm, wor I'm wondering about. I don't think we'll ever know. I doubt the technology exists for freezing the Arctic or we'd be employing it. I don't think anybody wants the human species to go extinct. I mean, there might be a lot of other sentient life out there that wants humans to go extinct for various reasons. But I don't think there's any humans, and certainly not those who benefit most from the system. I don't think there's any politicians who actually are in positions of power who want this system to go away because then they would lose their, lose their enormous privilege. But they right? want a reduction in population. Mm. You know, there's an easy way to do that. War. We know how to kill people. Why not just let the, the Arctic ice come out? Because that guarantees extinction. That guarantees the loss of habitat for humans on planet Earth. They're bunkered away. There's, listen, if the, if the last human being dies in a bunker surrounded by like-minded sociopaths, is that something I need to concern myself with? Every previous mass extinction event, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on Earth. And each of the previous five required several million years to recover. Several million years. The sociopaths in the bunkers are not going to last millions of years. Have you been around those people? It wouldn't last a week around me, or maybe the other way around. I mean, I don't think anybody who is reasonably rational is looking forward to a population reduction with what almost certainly means collapsed civilization. You know, Edward Abbey wrote 30 years ago, Civilization, like an airplane in flight, remains aloft only as it is moving forward. If civilization doesn't constantly go faster and, and involve continuous growth, 
then it falls apart. This has been the case for every one of the dozens of civilizations that have already collapsed. We need more bodies to throw into the breach. We need more wage slaves to keep the system going. If it doesn't grow, it collapses. No rational person is going to start suggesting a depopulation agenda because that goes exactly to the catastrophic meltdown of the world's nuclear power plants. So we're in this paradoxic situation that we have to continue human population growth, but doing that threatens the very planet on which we live. So it's a paradox. You can't continually grow the number of people on the planet. And if you reduce the number of people on the planet, the whole house of cards comes down. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. And, and HARP is something that the military abandoned long ago because it wasn't working. Well, I have to make a comment about that. Uh, there is quite a body of knowledge out there about the geoengineering activity, and I've observed myself for many, many years now, the chemtrails being formed over San Francisco uh, and other major metropolitan areas around the world. Um, there's sophisticated geoengineering technologies that go on, and they do use ionospheric heaters, which is what the HARP technology is, and that HARP thing, being shut down was just kind of a smoke screen. They have way more sophisticated installations around the world and via satellite. Um, and just to go into a little detail, you see the chemtrails up there, and suddenly you'll see like a vibrational looking pattern in the clouds. That are the scalar waves moving the air masses and, and so forth to modify weather. So that does go on, and I think what you were pointing out. Uh, that the military and uh, the deep state, whatever, have a lot of advanced technologies that the general public doesn't know about, and I think that's very, very true. And I believe that as this global crisis unfolds, uh, hopefully uh, some of these technologies will come out. And uh, in general, I don't know if uh, you all know Jim Shannon's work, um, but he many years ago was a consultant to the US Army and had proposed the New Earth Army, uh, which is uh, deploying our vast military forces in uh, remediation projects and building new cities and so forth around the world. And hopefully that's what's going to happen. Um, but I wanted to just come back to uh, the subject at hand of the uh, power plants. And uh, I'm wondering, Warren Carlinzig is here somewhere, Warren? Or did he take off? Maybe he did. But there's going to be data somewhere because every one of those power plants, there are different designs that are located in different situations. So each one of them will have a different profile as to how, what the methodology will be for shutting it down. <clears throat> so that's one of the first steps in uh, looking at this situation, I would suggest. Uh, we've also talked, Jamin, about the idea of uh, uh, communities being formed around these power plants whose mission it is to shut them down over a period of decades, which I think is a pretty, pretty cool idea. Uh, and we were uh, suggesting the idea that these communities be eco-city uh, kinds of projects, um, which I think is, I just want to bring that up and uh, uh, see what other conversation might come out uh, following that idea. Um, the definition of an arcology, Paolo Soleri's term combining architecture and ecology, is that you build a three-dimensional structure for most of your urban uh, complex and you leave the land uh, natural around it. Uh, but arcologies are, uh, their designs vary radically based on the, uh, the environment. So once again, the geological location of these power plants will dictate if it's really going to be uh, model ecocities. Uh, uh, they will uh, be dependent upon that, uh, that local uh, environment uh, for the design. But it would seem that these communities could be uh, deploying uh, uh, an evolving um, uh, arsenal of, of technologies and, and techniques uh, to deal with uh, capability they have to 
deal with uh, you know, both radiation and uh, other forms of uh, re remedi remediation. I think that technology and other uh, organic types of uh, methodologies uh, may well be uh, employed for this, this situation. So, other thoughts? Thank you, Michael. Um, I, this is probably for Jane, and I, I was wondering how how we could use uh, collective intelligence to solve these problems. And uh, it's almost an endless amount of ideas. It's selecting the ones that, that work. And so, how can collective intelligence? How, how how does that work? What does that look like? Sure, sure. Thank you. Great question. So, um, for those who who don't know. The focus of my work, I work with Michael Gosney, who just spoke speaker before last, uh, and a number of colleagues here in the United States, in India, in France, and elsewhere. We're working very hard to complete a platform for collective intelligence. Uh, our specific version of collective intelligence is called radical collective intelligence, as it seeks to get to the root of the world's most daunting problems. And it is a combination of collective human intelligence working together with artificial intelligence so that we can better understand the problems, better model Mother Earth and the various life-supporting systems, the Arctic ice, the, the climate, oceans, etc. And ultimately, to take all this knowledge and understanding and co-create all of the solutions uh, that we might wish to deploy. So let's start with shutting down nuclear power plants. To shut down the nuclear power plants, as Michael Gosney mentioned, one strategy is to co-locate, to build our colleges next to each nuclear power plant, to store and house people, equipment, materials, tools, uh, fuel, vehicles, spare parts, food, everything that that community would need to set about the multi-year or potentially multi-decade a task of shutting down and safely storing this nuclear material or preventing it from leaking out. Um, collective intelligence... I'm sorry? Did, did you want to speak to the room? No, feel free. Uh, okay, yeah. okay, all right. But I, I'll, I'll just finish my thought first, if you don't mind, and then, then, then I'll then I'll invite you to... Yeah, so um, the... We need collective intelligence to design these arcologies and to design the strategies and the mechanisms to shut down the nuclear power plants and store the material. Uh, and as was pointed out, there's myriad different designs of these nuclear power plants, so we need myriad different solutions and strategies and technologies to deal with each and every one. Um, <clears throat> beyond shutting down nuclear, uh, I am a proponent of exploring uh, strategies for refreezing the Arctic and for preventing the complete loss of Arctic ice, which would almost certainly result in all the cascading effects that have been discussed, uh, leading to massive, the, the, an acceleration of the current sixth mass extinction. Um, there are those who, including Guy, who say that that's, you know, that's not possible. I say let's explore it because we don't know if something is possible or impossible or possible until it's done, until we actually achieve it. Everyone says it's impossible until it's done. So um, the big idea of collective intelligence is that we collectively explore all these different options, refreezing the Arctic, shutting down nuclear power plants, cleaning up the oceans. And depending on your perspective, if you think that humanity is a goner and that it's, it's impossible to prevent uh, abrupt climate change to the extent that it wipes out all of complex life on Earth, then uh, your priorities might naturally gravitate towards let's shut down nuclear, right? We're all, we're all gonna be gone, so let's focus our efforts on shutting down nuclear. My perspective includes that, but also includes let's do what we can to forestall this collapse, so that we can buy ourselves some more time um, in order to, among other things, build out the arcologies and all the systems and tools and technologies that we need to shut down nuclear properly. 
How do we buy time? I'm a big proponent of shading up in the Arctic to prevent the total loss of Arctic ice. And if we can refreeze the Arctic, let's explore that. So those are two of the big uh, high priority items for collective intelligence, but ultimately could be applied to any problem um, and any potential solution. Yes, sir. Shutting down nuclear. Yeah, very, very interesting. There's a whole other school that suggests that nuclear is the solution of the problem. Uh, the seven billion people on the world don't exist without energy. And the only way we ever got seven billion was to, of course, suck out the, uh, the carbon uh, from the, the sort of uh, solar energy from eons past and use it 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 and that's why we have global warming because all the carbon went up there and the greenhouse effect etc etc so there are a number of people that suggest that nuclear is the solution of the problem i don't know i'm not uh, i'm not an expert however um uh, your state of arizona phoenix you can't have that many people live there without AC, and AC is not going to exist without um, that big nuclear power plant. I don't even know where it's located. It's out in the sticks, way out in the sticks. You're not going to put an arc thing there because it's just in the center of nowhere. Uh, but it generates a whole power that permit, uh, permits the AC that allows the people to live there. And when that thing goes down, um, there be fewer people living there. Um, so I, 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 I just want to throw that in there as you suggest that we shut down that source of energy. And, you know, I, I don't own stock in it, you know, nuclear or, uh, energy thing or anything, but I, I am enough familiar with um, the whole system to realize that energy is it's what permits us to be what we are. And energy mostly burns carbon, and a little bit is nuclear. That's you know, so we're afraid nobody's mentioned that. Um, that's, you know, I, just, I just want to throw that little piece out there. Why are you talking about a channel like that? I know that there are several people, including climate scientists, who are fans of nuclear energy. And I don't understand that at all, because the creation of cement, the second largest source of greenhouse gases after the transportation sector, the cement used for nuclear power plants is tremendous. Nuclear power plants don't become carbon neutral until they've been operating for at least two decades, at which point they're unsafe, and they shut down. So the notion that nuclear power plants are carbon neutral is nonsense if you actually look at the life cycle analysis. And you know, the very idea violates the notion that we need to create something over which we have no control. We have never figured out how to deal with the so-called waste. We don't have the slightest idea how to shut one down permanently safe life. And yet we just keep marching along as if some miracle is going to come along and save us. How about if we figure out what to do with this, with something before we implement it at the scale of 400 and some of the things around the globe? Why don't we determine what the maximum worst case problem might be, plan for that before we start building these things all over the planet? But instead, we just build and build and build because we think we need more energy. Well, we do if we're going to have an ever-growing human population. The solution to the human population is not more food and not more energy. Yeah, but nobody's going to say things like fewer people except you and me in this room. <laughs> Politically incorrect. I'm sorry to come back to you guys, but I was talking to Professor uh, Phelps, uh, 
Ron Felser, and he was saying that as uh, green, the ice on Greenland melts, it creates a current that will negate the Gulf Stream. So all of this northern uh, part of uh, this continent, uh, of, of both of this hemisphere, will become cooler. And so maybe that will be uh, the rebirth of the ice age. You know, I've actually studied this issue for a while. <laughs> yes, the Gulf Stream is slowing down. Yes, the thermohelium conveyor belt has reversed six times in planetary history that we know about. Yes, it's likely that we can have a situation that would play out over years or decades analogous to the film The Day After Tomorrow, when it played out over a few hours. This is why we call it climate change, not global warming because some places are going to get cooler. And that's not going to be a picnic either. We're heading for global average temperature at or near the highest observed on planet Earth in the last 2 billion years by 2026. The reversal of the thermodynamic conveyor belt, the Gulf Stream, is not going to slow that down. I've seen no evidence to suggest that. I've seen a lot of reporting about it in the corporate media none of which points to a solution, none of which points to any slowing of the overheating of the planet that's already underway. We're at 1.73 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline, and rapidly going higher than that. The highest temperature, the highest global average temperature with humans on it, according to James Hansen, is about 2 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline. We're at 1.73. Changing the year, Ocean circulation in the Atlantic Ocean is not going to save us. The new ice age is not on the way. Overheating has ensured that the next ice age is not going to happen with human beings on the planet. And it's not that I'm happy about this. I wish we were headed for an ice age. We'd be fine. We have technology. Clothes, fire. Ice ages aren't easy for big fuzzy beings like us. But overheating, which is actually where we're headed, that's a huge problem. Talking about is a phenomenon called global dimming. 
the same time, industrial activity produces greenhouse gases, which warm the planet by trapping heat with the atmosphere. At the same time we're doing that, most people are familiar with that. They're familiar with the greenhouse effect of industrial activity producing these greenhouses. There are 40-some greenhouse gases that are trapping heat, holding in the heating of the planet that comes from the sun. At the same time we're doing that, industrial activity also produces particulates, most notably aerosols, and especially sulfates associated with burning poor quality coal. You've heard about clean coal? Clean coal is the dense coal that doesn't have very much sulfur in it. The really good stuff, if you want to keep the planet cool through global dimming, is the really bad stuff. Poor quality coal, quote, unclean coal, is the best we can do. By burning high sulfur coal, we put sulfates into the atmosphere, which serves as an umbrella. So the at the same time, industrial activity is producing blankets, known as greenhouse gases. Industrial activity is also producing umbrellas, known as sulfates, that keep us cool. And so far, the cooling effect appears to be greater than the heating effect. An unintended consequence that, you know, we've known about the greenhouse effect, the earliest Referee journal paper on the subject was in April of 1896. We've known about that for a while. It was by Cynthia Arrhenius, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But we didn't know about global dimming, according to the Referee Journal literature, until December of 2011. 115 years later. So this is something that's relatively new, something that we didn't know about for a long time, an unintended and so far positive impact. But if we turn off the switch of industrial civilization, if we stop putting that, burning that coal and putting the sulfates into the atmosphere, the planet heats up catastrophically quickly. So it's, it's a paradoxical situation by which industrial civilization heats the planet through greenhouse gases, and if we stop producing greenhouse gases, we also stop producing the sulfates, global dimming goes away, and the planet heats up even faster. So that's awkward. So you're right, there's a lot of things we don't know. Which is why I constantly refer to the, to the notion of the precautionary principle. We don't know things, so let's take the most precautionary route. And instead, what we've done as a species for some 300,000 years is throw caution to the wind and go for whatever makes us happy in the moment. It's nearly as I can tell. Thanks for bringing that up. People always tell me I should talk more about global dimming because most people have never even heard of the concept. And you give me an opportunity because I always forget. So what makes me think people are going to come together? I don't know. I'm not under any such delusion. 
I'm not. I would like to think that that's the case. I would love to rally the troops and join the charge, and I would be the first person to throw my body into the breach on a nuclear power facility. Because I don't have any children, and almost everybody who knows about me hates me. So I would gladly pour that bucket of concrete into the sarcophagus. Gladly. I would go, pick me, I'll go first. Really, seriously. And I know there's a bunch of other people who would be willing to do the same, and maybe that gives me some glimmer of optimism. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people, equally stupid as I am, who would gladly throw their, their ill-begotten lives into the nuclear power plant and maybe prevent one more Chernobyl from going Fukushima. I'd be willing, and I know lots of people who are even as miserable as I am with their lives, and so they might be willing to do the same thing. You don't know. I see a lot of miserable people out there. There's people driving tan cars. <laughs> you know, to quote Louis C. K. in an excellent book, but people driving tan cars with windows broken out, and so they got that plastic in there, and so sort of <laughs> I mean, if that was me, I'd take a nuclear power facility and throw my body into the, into the breach right away. I don't have a tan car. I towed my car twice since moving to Belize. Twice. I've only driven it about 20 miles. <laughs> Oddly, Pauline doesn't like me driving her truck. <laughs> Weird. I haven't even totaled it yet. So, precautionary principle again. I'd like to think, and, and I'd like to set an example by pointing out what I think needs to be done if we're to preserve the potential for future life on Earth. Do I think it's going to happen? No. Because I've been hearing since I was 10 years old what we need to do to forestall environmental disaster. And I haven't seen us do any of those things. And that's been 48 years now. We haven't done any of those things. Is this the time? Could be. I keep hearing, if we start right now, I've been hearing that for 48 years, maybe we're there. I'd like to think so. Even though nobody has done it, but it's been talked about, 
and perhaps if we just look into a both combination of economical visibility and technological visibility, many there's a solution. So I just wonder if I have a look into that. Very good, thank you. And I just want to clarify what uh, I, I'm with you. I'm, I search for solutions too. I, I identify myself as a solutionary. My colleague Michael Gazi is a solutionary. There's a lot of us out there. And when we say solutions, what we don't mean is, hey, we can solve everything with technology. That's what we don't mean. If we do nothing more than build the art college to shut down the nuclear power plants, that is a successful solution. And then we all die. Okay? That's still a successful solution. We've shut down nuclear. We've at least given Mother Earth the possibility to bounce back, even if it takes millions of years. And um, to your point earlier about the global dimming, here we accidentally cooled the planet by about 3 degrees C um, with our coal burning power plants and other, other uh, sources of particulates. So if we do that by accident, I think it's kind of where, where your point is going. What if we actually put our heads together and overcome our collective stupidity for guys' three words, three word thesis, which I agree with? People are stupid. You're looking at a stupid individual here at the microphone. But my hypothesis is, my thesis, if we come together and form a collective intelligence and a movement to build this collective intelligence with more and more members and more and more technology, if we can cool the planet by three degrees by accident, and we form a collective intelligence that's orders of magnitude smarter than us stupid individuals, we might be able to intentionally achieve some degree of cooling. Cool. It's possible, it's physically possible. So my thesis is, that the most urgent thing is for us to come together, as we are doing right here tonight, continue coming together, and form a global movement and a global community, coming together in person, coming together online, that's what my organization, Radish.org, Pioneer of Radical Collective Intelligence, is all about, enabling people to come together online so that we can form myriad, impromptu, and organized groups to grapple with these different questions. You see, in this room we've got a lot of different expertise, and we're, this is a form of collective intelligence right here. You come to the microphone and contribute your thoughts, contribute your ideas, contribute your knowledge to the conversation. That enriches the conversation. Now imagine that there are millions of us engaged in this pursuit of exploring what's possible. What's possible if we put our minds together and all of our knowledge and all of the accumulated knowledge uh, of, on, on planet Earth. For example, take all of the peer-reviewed academic journal articles, science, engineering, and otherwise. Imagine that we were able to tap into that in a systematic way. That's a big part of what radical collective intelligence is all about. I talked about that at the last dinner on March 22nd. Got many hours of content on YouTube about the topic, um, and I encourage everyone to look into it because I believe it's perhaps our greatest hope for achieving whatever we put our minds to, whether it's shutting down nuclear, refreezing the Arctic to buy some time, or perhaps even more optimistic scenarios than that. So, welcome everyone's input. Please keep the comments. Any questions coming? Thank you. Thank you. So, about uh, this idea of shutting down the power plants, um, it seems like to do that effectively, it would have to either, you know, these, these arcs it would have to be either very secretive groups of people or would have to be done in the full light of the governments involved in the country of the Soviets. Um, and also, I don't know if it would be possible to be secretive and also an acting on it, not necessarily. So uh, I wonder if it makes sense to focus on the 
power plants outside of the U.S. for now. Um, since the government of the U.S. doesn't even, well, I guess, now start to work on change from the U.S. and would involve acknowledging climate change to be involved in that. Uh, so that's one. Yes. Yeah. The other reason I ask how many of us, you know, that's Sure, sure, sure. Well, I just want to point out, I mean, it remind us that we're not, you know, there's this ongoing long-time movement against nuclear and for nuclear. It was pretty astounding. Stuart Brad came out years ago with his book where he was saying nuclear was the only option now, you know, and GMO was cool. And, you know, I said, what? But uh, I just want to remind everyone that we're talking about this situation when we have these catastrophic events going on that we need to deal with the nuclear power plants. We're not talking about protesting nuclear power right now. I mean, that's not the main thrust of this discussion. It's about what do we do with these power plants that are many of them located on the water or in different areas that are going to be radically impacted. And, you know, under controlled circumstances, most of them would take apparently 30 years to decommission totally, right? Something like that. So we're just talking about dealing with a severe situation. Um, I just want to add to the conversation what I think, you know, we're working on uh, marshalling radical collective intelligence toward these solutions. But if we don't get um, a huge uh, public movement going, we're going nowhere. And this is why uh, the media and the technology are the two sides of the coin, in my view. We have to have, I mean, and right now, Netflix has, I don't know how much money in the bank, ready to produce new content, new series, and uh, we, we've got to get some documentaries going, we've got to get some major media projects going uh, to spread this awareness and get people woke. <laughs> so, and we have some filmmakers in the room, and yeah. uh, uh, there you go, sir. Let me, uh, okay. let me mention something briefly about nuclear power plants and decommissioning. In 2013, I was in New York City where they had a forum on lessons learned from Fukushima. And at this forum was the former Prime Minister of Japan and Greg Jasko, who was the former commissioner of the nuclear commissioner of this country, who had resigned because he couldn't get safety, the, 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 the safety checks that he wanted to have installed in all the nuclear plants, whether they were not being built or being built or being run, he couldn't get anything passed. And I asked him a direct question. I said, how long does it take to decommission a power plant, which is different from closing it? You can close a power plant tomorrow. Decommissioning takes, he said. 50 to 60 years. 50 to 60 years. Not because they can't do it in a year or two or three, but there's not enough money to do it. And they leave that job up to the power company that owns the power company. So in New York, where I live, we have Indian Point, which is three reactors, and two of them are shut down now. But one of them is running without a license. It's 35 years old. The license expired. Now, can you imagine if you were driving your car without a license? <laughs> They're running a nuclear power plant that can kill 200,000 people in a 50 mile radius. Now, that's criminal. So if we can't stop that, what can we stop? And to your point, we can't do these things secretly. We've got to do it in light of day, presently, let everybody know this is what we're doing because you guys are stupid and you're not doing your jobs protecting the people. And if a power plant melts down, it's not insured. Everybody loses their property. We all lose. And, and people don't seem to know these things or care. As soon as, they, oh, oh, we're going to put in a power plant, oh, jobs. No. That means 
prostate cancer. That means breast cancer. That means the fish that are, you know, being caught right near the, the outflow of the nuclear power plant all have isotopes in them. So these are questions, and those are the answers, and we know. We know what we have to do. And it's got to be in the light of day, and it needs a lot of people that are committed and willing to throw themselves in a breach. And of course, your ex force fire, firefighter here is ready to do that. <laughs> Jim McGreen brought me here. Um, I lost my home in the Sonoma fires. Complete destruction, everything we had. 150 projects, all my history, everything gone. My life has to be reinvented now. What is this thing that happened to me? What is it? It is, PGD says climate change. They want to say, they want to blame it on what's happening to the temperature and the wind and so forth. Well, it didn't have to happen. It was a, there was a solution. And it was us. So what we do. Uh, I've been living with this for months now. It's been a horrific thing. And for them to say, to use the excuse of the excuse of climate change, this world, and this is it, it's a horrible excuse that the system out. This was something they could have dealt with. It was human action on a human problem, and that's what you're talking about. You're saying that there, there are things we can do technically, the things we can do with our will and our heart and our spirit. And that could have saved my house and my life and my history. And I'm here telling you that is a terrible thing to face. I face what we're all facing. How many of us read Scientific American? How many hands can you see? Okay. A few. Need more. Uh, Harper's Magazine? A couple. The New Yorker? A few. Uh, there are many more. Information, getting this up. Somebody said, this is about media, this is about changing minds, but we don't make, it, it make this exciting. Right now, what I'm seeing is, I hate to say it, a little pathetic. We need some action and some light and some serious work. And you said, it, essentially, it is about getting the word out. But we need to do it because we're competing with the biggest money and the biggest greed we've ever seen in the history of the world. And these few want it all. I don't know what they want. I have no idea what that all is. The all of what? Um, to me, I always like to say, um, what Elon Musk talks about going to Mars. Well, you better clean up your room first, Elon. Before you go out there, don't go out and play before you clean your room up. Well, this is a big room, and we're not doing it. Uh, this, I mean, we need dynamism here. We need, some, we need some serious media and some serious interpretation. I've been making films for 35 years. I lost about $300,000 of equipment in that fire. I lost, again, my history. Um, it's tough to watch this. I mean, where are the young people? Where are, how can we make them see the same thing we see and feel? This is terribly important. I think you're on the right track. I think the solutionary notion is wonderful, but how do we make that, I don't want to use the word fire. Uh, how do we get this going? So, I mean, I just, I mean, I think we're all in this together, but. This needs more guts, but it doesn't have it. We made a film called The Russian River, Old Rivers, the, the value of an American watershed for a community, and I spent money on that movie, and it was amazing. 5,000 people came to local theaters to see that film. It went to local PBS, but there was almost no 
action following it. People sat, watched it, and said, oh, very nice. What a wonderful, wonky film to make. And that was it. I felt as if I wasted my time, probably three and a half, four years of my life, spent on getting that word out, and there was nothing. And I was so disappointed. What, oh, what are, what's wrong with us? There's something seriously wrong. And we need to address it. And I think the word solutionary is a brilliant term. But we better ignite that term. Yeah. Put a fire behind it. Yeah. And that's it. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're all passionately committed to this. Um, so, I mean, I, I can imagine Guy's pretty tired by now because he's been singing this song for a long time. And you kind of burn out, I imagine, you know? It's like, how many times does a canary have to tweet before it croaks, you know? Well, but, but hang on. I'm not saying that you can or cannot. I'm just... But, but we are passionately committed to this, and we live this every day. I get what you're saying about where are the youth. I have this kind of cynical view that I, I think it's going to take a lot of a huge crisis to wake people up. Um, just like, I'm so sorry you lost your house, but um, I think we lose, and I'm not saying this to you personally, but I think often loss can bring awakening for people, and that's just how it functions here on this earth. Um, and this, this isn't a mystical discussion. This is real. This is science. Yeah, but they're this not. What I'm sorry. We can't, right. we can't uh, look to the gods and ask them to save us. But this yeah. is real. <laughs> um, These two guys are spot on. Right, they're but you know, on. it's I. It is a mystical conversation as well as a real physical one because there are different things operating in different realms. They're just not visible. Not to and, me, of course. Well, that's okay. You, you can believe what you want to believe. Consciousness. No, consciousness is right. Consciousness. If you want to call it that, that's fine. That's fine. We all have different ways of calling it, and it's still the same thing. Spirit, consciousness. <laughs> so. More of a genetic field. Yeah, this is good. This is heating up. I like yeah, it. Exactly. All right. Let's right. keep the heat going. No, no, no. Yes, good. Let's get it. The young people know. The young people know this is happening. And that's why they're not here. Because they're living. Thank you. They they know we're done. If you sit down with them and talk to them, they know. And they're sick of our bullshit. Yeah, I'm frankly. Yeah, yeah. They're tired of it. They're like, you guys, you what, guys what, ruined it. What do we you do? ruined it for us. What do we do? What do we what do you got? What, what we have to do something. Well, we're we're stuck. No, no. We're no, stuck no, with no, the mess we made. Uh, what, so we made the mess. We voted these assholes into power. We made well, this no, happen. I, I, I think that we is a fairly extensive we. It is. But this gentleman had something to say a moment. Just the, the young if you can go to the microphone. Sorry, none of, none of the young people that I've talked to about guys' work are surprised by it or anything. They're, those of them that are apathetic are apathetic because they look at the previous generation already about it very eloquently, continuously, for decades. And I don't think it's just that people are stupid. I think it's also that people are cowards. And the young generation sees that very clearly. They see people talking about, we have to do something, we have to do something, what is it that we have to do? When clearly, it's the, the, the obstacle is people not being willing to throw themselves into the breach. And that's what, that's what takes the wind out of the sails of the young people who see the decades of inaction because they see themselves as a logical extension of their parents, who are apathetic and cowardly. So that's, I think, the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty good point, sir. I'm sorry, Adam, I've got to do this to you. Um, we're talking about America, 
Yeah, Europe's a very different situation. No, right. My daughter is a 30-year-old. She lives in Europe. And um, all of her friends who are in their 20s and 30s, they know, they're aware, and they're living differently. They're not making the same choices as we are here in America. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And uh, I don't think we're stupid. I don't think we're lazy. Um, I think what's wrong with this is we're poisoned. I think we're, we are under the influence of a literal poison, and it's causing us to go insane. It's causing us to act insane. And that poison is called money. It's, it is, I, and I've been doing some research on it, right? I'm, I'm looking for help. Anybody, anybody wants to help me? But there's not a lot of research out there on uh, neuropathology of money in the brain. But there is some. And I've been finding some out there that, that uh, relates the neuropathology in the brain of the effects of money. And, uh, and, and equates them, they're, they're actually, on an individual human brain, it's, it's uh, comparable to uh, using drug, uh, uh, cocaine or heroin. So, but there, it's also, um, it affects us as a, as a human species. I mean, just the way money works. For instance, um, for example, uh, what is the true leader of a corporation? I mean, the corporations are what are really what's making um, what, what's running the country. Our, our our government is is pretty much bought and paid for by corporations. Well, what's the real leader of a corporation? Is it is it the CEO? I don't think so. In fact, I think that the real leader of a corporation is not a living human being. It's a concept. It's a, it's a you could say it's a spirit. I say it's a poison. Because I don't like the word spirit because spirit conjures up supernatural forces. But like if a, if a person gets rabies and goes insane, we know that the person goes insane because of the poison, because of the viral poison in the center. So it makes sense. We don't, we don't call out the witch doctor or the exorcist to, to fix the person. We know what's wrong with them. Could you do me a favor? Yes. Could you ask how many people in this room think that greed plays a factor? Is that, is that greed, part of this? Greed. How many people in this room think that greed is a serious factor in this? Okay. Repeat the question into the microphone. Yeah, the gentleman asked me uh, to ask the room if uh, greed is. Uh, yeah, how many people think that greed is a problem? Okay, let me let me explain <laughs> something. Two hands. Uh, let me explain Two something. Greedy hands over. Greed is a byproduct of the poison of money. <coughs> Human beings yeah. cannot help but to. It's like using heroin. If, once you start using it, you're going to get addicted to it. And the closer you get to it, it's like radiation. The closer you get to it, the sicker you'll become. So these people that, that are rich, that, that are the so-called powers that be, they're just human beings like you and me. They, 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 some of them are probably benevolent. We, we don't you, know. Can I interrupt you again to ask how many people here like money? Everybody likes money. Okay, I like money. <laughs> we like money. Idiocracy. It's all like money. We all like money. I like money. Yeah. We, 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 no, no. we think we like <laughs> money. No. But I'm just saying, if you had but, somebody give you a we, we think We think we like money, but it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Capitalism is the problem. But, uh, the, no, the, the true leader of a corporation is is not is not a human being. It's money, because because it, it's made of a CEO who will get fired if he doesn't make money for the corporations. So then, and the only the thing that's really in charge of the corporation is the stockholders, but they don't know because they're invested through mutual funds, so they don't know what's going on. They all they care about is whether the stocks go up and down. So the CEO gets pressured by the board of directors, who gets pressured by the stockholders, and the next thing you know, the, the CEO passes that pressure down to his lower managers, and 
and the lower manager does something, makes a decision based on money instead of common sense. He doesn't buy the thou. And the next thing you know, the Gulf of Mexico is filled with 200 million gallons of oil. It all relates back to money. And, and, all, and, and another thing I want to say is that the U.S., um, the United States, we started everything. And we took oil out of the ground and developed the internal combustion engine, and we started the Industrial Revolution. So um, we're the ones that brought this on the world. We brought on nuclear power. I mean, we should be the ones leading the world out of this. Yes. Yep. And I like RCI because the first logical voice, a place where we can actually use artificial intelligence and, and, and co put this engine together, we can start uh, finding, we can start making, comp making good sense. Because we're, right. we're not influenced by money. Right. So, yeah. Right. Kudos to Raj Thank you. Thanks, John. I, I just want to say something really quickly. Um, I think we forgot that everything is sacred, and we, we stopped treating water as sacred, yeah. the land is sacred, and the air is sacred, and the First Nations people know this. First of all, I'd like to say just thank you to everyone who is actually here and, and in this conversation, and really in a big way, and my heart goes out to you and to everyone who has suffered loss, great loss, and really especially to the Mother Earth. There are comments I could make about everything that everyone has said, and yet I think if we do not look with, through the lens of a holistic model, we won't be able to bring anything truly to light. So, in other words, while we're talking about toxicity, corporate capitalism tends to run a pretty toxic wheel because there tends to be a lack of morals, a lack of ethics, a lack of respect for Mother Earth, for the air, for the water. And so if we don't face those fundamental principles, bring to light the truth of the, of the, of the core issues that are at the root of the problems. Greed, maybe, yes. I understand that money activates that same segment of the brain that cocaine does. Some people are highly addictive and some people are less addictive. The opioid crisis that we have in our nation, because a certain family was very, very determined to make a lot of money getting people involved in opioids. Well, now they want to cut off the opioids for people. I'm allergic to, to them, by the way, so I'm not an opioid advocate. But, so what does that mean? So then the black market gets stronger. So then they're more of a drug war. But hey, aspartame is in all of the chewing gum, every diet soda. You know what aspartame is? It was discovered in a factory. A cousin of mine had cousins in Germany where they discovered what they later called aspartame. It's a solvent used to clean machines. It is a neurotoxin. It is everywhere. Try to buy a stick of gum in an airport. Our population has been infiltrated with aspartame, uh, MSG. Uh, I could go on and on and on. These are neurotoxins. Think about the word aspartame or tame a spar. So people who want to duel, who actually want to get into it and, and make a difference, forget it. That a lot of things have been planned way ahead of time to keep everybody harnessed on that little hamster wheel, serving the machine, because once the machine came into being, then there had to be worker bees, but there had to be consumers too. So yes, we have to come together we have to clean up our systems as best we can so that we can stand strong, clear, address the real problems with real solutions. Thank you, Hi. Um, I just wanted to say two things. One, thank you, of course, all of you for being here. Thank you for being here. That's actually not one, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to, last time I was here, I left pretty depressed. 
because the message I got was that we're going to become extinct, and I have you know two young twenty-something kids, and um, and all of a sudden this has become top of mind. And there are times when I can't sleep because I'm so worried about it. I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. So what struck me, I mean, there are two things going on in my mind. One, I had to find a plot of land somewhere where I could survive. You know, I could buy land for my kids and their kids that they dared to have them so we could survive. And I got into that survival scarcity mode. And I thought, man, that's really bad. I don't want to go there. And God help us that everybody starts going there. And I realized that no matter where we're headed, whether it's in seven years or 20 years or 80 years, we, we, the most important, I think, thing we have to do is keep some hope going, because this could turn really bad if everybody starts freaking out and getting into our selfish survival mode. And to me, that is really scary. So one, I would just hope that we could have a message, even if it's absolutely true, that there is no hope, and that we really should be focusing on shutting down nuclear power plants, that we maybe leave out the word extinction <laughs> and leave in the word hope because that's the only way we're all going to keep going. So then I decided, well, I have to be part of the solution. And I'm just a, a, a lonely person out here. I haven't studied climate change. I haven't, you know, all the things that you all have been doing. But I am active in the business world. I, I have one foot in one industry, another foot in the other, other industry. I, I'm on think tanks, think tanks and board of directors where I interact with a lot of very powerful people. I'm usually the lowest person in the room. But I interact with these people, and it's really interesting. I'm about to go to, to a, a group next week in Detroit where we're having brainstorming sessions, and, they, and I look at the PowerPoint that we're going to be discussing, and they're such short-term thinking. You know, they're all, all this talent coming together just, and I'm like, wow, like these people, they're, they're power, they're in power, they own all sorts of assets, they can, they can make change, they head companies. In this case, these are these are CEOs of um, and, and CFOs of hotel companies and hotel REITs that own have massive investments in real estate. And I'm like, what is what the heck? Like, what? You know what I mean? Like, really? So I'm thinking. So I made a push to myself because I do a lot of public speaking. That everywhere I go, no matter what. Last night I spoke at a university. Wherever I go, I'm going to bring this topic up, no matter how uncomfortable it is, and I'm going to do it my own little way and get people talking. And I would love to do this next week when I go to Detroit, is to see to these people and I'm going somewhere else in another month. And I thought, I would love to have, because I know there are great books and I'm reading a couple of books right now on climate change, but they're pretty heavy, you know? And, and I'm thinking, God, you know, nobody has any attention span anymore. Right. And I was gonna ask, is there any piece? Could we come out with 10 different pieces for different levels of intellect and attention span? And maybe my kids who are millennials have to be on the shortest end of that, and it has to be very visual and musical or something. But different ways of communicating the issue and do it just like you did last time. Because what you did last time was told the whole story. It was brilliant. You presented the problem, you gave the history of extension of species, you expressed, you expressed the problem. You, I was just like, I got it. Like the light bulb just went off. And I thought, if we could just start educating people, I, have, I mean, I have educated, intelligent friends in business who I talk to them about this, and they still say to me, you know, I know the climate's changing because it's hotter when I'm at a golf course these days, but I, I really wonder, I really don't believe, I'm not buying in that it's humans that are doing this. And I'm like, what? Have you read about what the internal combustion, what the industrial revolution, they knew this when they came out with the, with the, with the um, internal combustion? I'm like, what? And I'm going, blah, 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 and they look at me like, She's just off on a rant, and I'm like, these people are ignorant. But these are, but these are the people who are in power, and they're college educated, and they're supposedly intelligent, but they don't know they're ignorant. They're and mesmerized. Like, they're mesmerized. But They've we have been it. programmed. We have. But you know what? Careful. A lot of these are all good people. I believe a lot of these are well intentioned. If they knew, if they had, were actually in their face and got some information, uninformed. Yeah. So if, if they could actually. Be, if they could, the light bulb could go off amongst the group of them, and then they could start joining together, the collective intelligence, and they could get the mojo of working together and saying, hey, let's not stick our head in the sand, let's start working together. And each little industry starts percolating and communicating that maybe there's some, you know, some good could come out of that. But I guess my, my frustration is I don't have a way of intelligently communicating and educating. There has to be a, a rise up from the people at all levels, you know, whether it, you know, be your, you know, yeah. anyway, so those are the, yeah, but, 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 but informed, I mean, I, 
Yeah, yeah. Sorry. You know, um, we did a film called at the California State Railroad Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was great. It inspired me to get up. So. Um, uh, we did a film at the California State Railroad Museum about the history of railroad. It took us to England, across the United States, to California. We did a history of the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, at the 50th anniversary. Uh, all these films went off to the world. Everybody loves this stuff. But we need something like this. The solutionary is a great term. It's a great, oh my god, it's a great term. Yeah, and that's the thing that'll hook. I mean, I may, I may think your information is not the best, but you're, you're good, you're doing well, uh, you're brilliant, obviously. This, this, is, this is something that we need to do. We need this to get promoted. That's all there is to it. I mean, I mean what you said, it's so true. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's got to get out there. But I mean, with us, look at us. I mean, we're like the dirty dozen. <laughs> you know? I mean, we need more. We need more. We need to influence and promote. Promote, promote, promote. We're up against trillions of dollars of promotion. It's got to happen. Yeah. But you see, everything starts somewhere. Yeah. And right, here, right, now. right here. Right now. Exactly. Yeah. This series. Well, it started on March 22nd. Okay. Actually, it started a year before that. And the guy and Pauline came up to our their first year at Club Dinner Talk. And for them, it started years before that. Um, what I wanted to mention about solutionaries. Well, first of all, I want to thank Michael Gosney for telling me the term solutionary. Michael, raise your hand so people know who you are. <laughs> Michael is a solutionary. I think it refers from different people. Barbara Mike's hovered among them. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the big point is... Evolutionaries would be worse than the solutionaries. <laughs> sure. No, but that's a good point. You know, who came up with it? Who cares? Let's use it, yeah. right? That's great. Right. And uh, in terms of solutions, you know, one of the solutions, uh, as you were talking now, about, you know, we need, you know how, how do we get people to wake up? How do we get people to engage? There are solutions for that. Yeah. Yeah. There are solutions for that. It's not just about engineering solutions, financial solutions, political solutions. What I believe needs to precede all of those, you go way upstream, a new story for humanity. Yeah. 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 Who are we? Why are we here? How did we get here? How did we mess everything up? And where in the heck are we going from here? Right? It could be fun. It could be it fun. Could be fun. Yeah. Right? Well, let's make some short films. I've never been I've never had more fun in my life. Yeah, yeah. Julia says let's make some let's make some films. Let's do it. Solutionaries speak. Solutionaries speak. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And in fact, I have a weekly standing one hour public video conference that anyone can join every Tuesday. And the topic is a new story for humanity. And we get on. Everyone's encouraged to join. Uh, go to radish.org. We're going to be posting all the uh, links to all this. So, um, and we get together and we talk about this. And we say, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? What's it going to take? The first step is asking the question, what's it going to take? And coming together, just like we're doing tonight, in this rough, scrappy, you know, non-flashy presentation modality that we're in, people coming together around the campfire and saying, what do we do? As my cat would say, meow. As no one's <laughs> cat would say, meow. Big meow. Big meow. Big meow. So we need solutions across the board. And if you look at the fact that we're addicted to money, and that we're mesmerized by aspartame and myriad other chemicals in our environment. And oh, myriad, yeah. yeah. Twenty-year-olds yeah. oh, yeah. that eat fast foods. Apparently, their blood is now fifty percent plastic. Oh, people that the young people that are eating fast foods on a regular basis. A new report is showing that the twenty-year-olds who are in the fast foods on a regular basis, their blood is showing that they are about 
50% plastic themselves. So. Wow. So that's I am plastic man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look, we, we've, we've just got, it's a cluster mess of problems upon problems upon problems upon problems. And taking full stock of the cluster mess of problems that we're all facing, Mother Earth, humanity, all species, that's what inspired me to set upon this journey of radical collective intelligence. I realized these problems are way too big, way too entrenched, there's way too many of them. They're coming at us from every angle. And um, it's just it's too much for any one of us to cope with. But if we all come together and realize the dream and the potential of radical collective intelligence, we can create a form of, of intelligence, orders of magnitude greater than anything witnessed on Earth. And bring the kids. And bring the kids, bring everyone. Because we need the elders. The elders have so much knowledge and wisdom from decades past, before we got so immersed in radiation and aspartame and, and all, these, all these things. And, and we need the youth, and we need everyone in between. We need all of us to come together. Super solutionaries. Super. Well, the ultimate solutionary is all of us coming together. Super. So, more comments, please. More questions. This is what I'm talking about. We're doing it right here. It may seem kind of you know scrappy and thrown together, but how else? How else other than people coming together and talking and sharing ideas and building upon those ideas? Thank you. Uh, you can go all over the internet today and, and find out all kinds of information about the problems. I mean, but there's no place to go to uh, where are the solutions. And that's what I like about radical, the whole concept of radical collective intelligence is, is finally there will be a place where we can go where the solutions are gathered together. And we can, we can Look it up. Look up what we need to look up. Uh, we can offer our own inputs, and then this artificial intelligence will assimilate this information. I mean, it's apparent the government's not going to do it, and and we all know they're run by the by the corporations. And I I really like what you said about the um, you know you went to these meetings and, and these people are. are you, you, they're just oblivious to reality. But these are good people. So why are they doing it? Why, why, did, why are we doing this? We do it because we made money our, our motive for survival. So they, they do these things. They think they're doing good. They're just doing like everybody else. They're, they're making money so they can survive, so they can send their kids to college. And, and, and so that's, that's where the, I believe that, or I think, uh, that uh, money is a poison. How about ethical capitalism? I, I don't think there's any such thing. <laughs> well, actually, since you brought up ethical cap capitalism, one of the solutions that we've been developing within Radish, within Radical Collective Intelligence, is precisely a new mode of production for the global economy which we call a compassionate economy. Yes. And um, anyway, a lot more on that up on, on radish.org. But the, the gist of it is that companies no longer operate uh, for, uh, for profit, for hoarding, but that all profits must be donated to the appropriate causes, the appropriate projects, so that all businesses, all compassionate businesses, and we've, we've Trademark is a standard that we're developing for this called Triple C. Certified compassionate companies, things like certified organic. A premium on compassion. Exactly. And as these become popular, we put compassion in fashion. And we edge the hoarding companies, the greeting companies. We simply edge them out of the marketplace, replacing them with compassionate businesses. So in my mind, there are solutions to everything. We need to come up with myriad solutions and, like a Swiss watch, we need to get the gears and the pieces to fit together. This is a monumental task. I would say impossible for a single human mind 
but imminently possible for radical collective it's intelligence. Worth shot. It's, worth a it's worth a shot. What else are we going to do? Yeah. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just a few facts. Uh, this is actually the reason I mentioned aspartame. This is from the Ecologist magazine, September 2005. Uh, Ecologist magazine out of London. I'm not going to read you the whole article, but it, it does go on to say they didn't get approved, how, etc. What I do want you to know is that the conditions mimicked by aspartame toxicity include multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, fibromyalgia, arthritis, multiple chemical sensitivity, chronic fatigue syndrome, attention deficit disorder, panic disorder, depression and other psychological disorders, lupus, diabetes, and diabetic complications, birth defects, lymphoma, Lyme disease, and hypothyroidism. So the reason I mentioned aspartame, obviously, that's the, not the only problem. It's just one of the many factors that are influencing the fog, the illness, uh, the depression, the ADD that a lot of young people and, and older people are getting loaded with medicines to deal with, but actually holistic doctors find that when they remove the toxins from the patient's lifestyle or daily consumption, then the symptoms go away. So uh, I, I think everything that we're saying is really important, but I, again, want to speak to that fundamental need for a holistic approach to, to the question. And the need for holisticity, a holistic approach, yeah. undergirds what we do with, at, on radish.org. In fact, um, there, there's three major kind of components to Radish Network. There's the conversational domain, which is what we're having right here. For me, that's the engine of all ideas. There's people coming together and bouncing ideas off each other and saying, well, I never thought about it that way. Well, if we, well then if we did this, you see, that's this, this is this dynamic. And it can only happen when people come together, whether in person or online. Um, so that's the conversational domain. And the, the, uh, 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 the second of the three is what I call the toposphere the sphere of all topics and taxonomies of topics so that it's, they're structured, they're organized in a network that makes sense, a logical network, so the toposphere. The third realm is, Julia, I call, we call global holistic modeling. We need a model of all of Mother Earth so that we can say, okay, if we do this, what would be the impact? And so we can run myriad what-if scenarios and by generating myriad solutions. We can actually model individual solutions and we can model combinations of solutions until we come up with that, that optimal combination of solutions that will get us to where we can go and want to go. There's a lot of different possible paths we can go forward from here. Uh, most of us, most of them, leading to very dark outcomes. Amongst those, are there any paths that will lead us to, let's just think for a moment, what, I'm gonna start walking, what if, what, what would be sort of like a hierarchy of goals that we, could, that we could aim for? The first base level is shut down nuclear so that life can survive, right? If we do nothing else, okay, let's shut down all nuclear power plants, right? Okay, uh, so let's just call that level one. Level two, Perhaps we can refreeze the Arctic. Perhaps we can do other forms of shading that will prevent this abrupt climate change from just spiking exponentially and wiping us all out. How about bringing truth to the media across the board? <laughs> no more lying. No See, more alternative facts. I mean, how about advocating? No, but I mean, honestly, yeah. when or how, what will it take to get the truth out? Let's pull the wool off the eyes all the way around. But only if there's enough citizen pressure on government, local, regional, state, national government, only with our pressure will there be a response. 
if you looked at some of what the young people did and, and all ages for uh, the, the March for Science or the recent climate marches, I mean, people are moving and amassing, but until we really pull the wool off the eyes, uh, shift the fact that Fox News is still the, the, it's getting more attention than any other media outlet. So people are getting fed what that certain part of the spectrum wants the masses to hear. And until we change that piece of the equation, I think it will be very difficult to really uh, embrace the solutions. But, if, but even if we, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I don't feel like I should do this again, but do it. No, do it. Uh, but again, there, there's a liberal component of this too. I mean, um, again, it's money. I mean, well, money is energy, but uh, people have well, given money. Money, money isn't energy. Value. It's it's money. It's an abstract way of doing things. This is. I mean, Smith came up with this. This is a, a product of the Enlightenment. So we thought ourselves. With the notion of economics, the invisible hand and my invisible pocket, my nothing. invisible wallet, my invisible right. money. Right. Um, or the plastic. Yes. You know. but, uh, but When the power is gone, what good is the plastic? Right. You could have all the money. But, but, but uh, this has so much to do with how we do things. You know? But if, if indeed we, we vote in a liberal government, you know, it's going to be at least a, a certain degree of the same thing. I mean, we've got this maniac situation now. But... Um, we're still moving forward, but it, it requires ethics. ethics. I mean, it's, I have to say, I'm getting tired of being a country, of being in a country full of assholes. Yeah, I'm sorry to use the term, but we have we kind of moved toward the asshole world. I mean, uh, we seem to think that taking things from you and you and you and you makes me better. It doesn't make me better. It makes me sicker. I don't, I, that's where we stand. It's like I get my upper hand on you, and I'm better than you. So, well, that is essentially wrong. And and I mean, I, I having studied Marx a little bit too. And believe me, I do like your money. But uh, we are as we move from the notion of a strictly material economy to why we work. We have just a piece on, on NPR the other day about about uh, um, why, uh, the TED hour, about why people do things. And they do things because they, they're emotionally involved. They get a reward. They feel good about what they do. That's why we do things. That's why we're here tonight. We're here because we care. We really care. We're, we're excited by being here. You know this. You know this. You know this. We're here because we care. And we keep doing it. We do it. But look how many people are here. We are indeed the dirty 23, 40. Uh, we need to be more. How do we get this going? You're good. You're, you're, you're good. You, you got the stuff. You know what this takes. You, you're out there. You're in the corporate world. You know what's wrong, too. And what's wrong is that we need to work the caring part, the hard part, solutionaries of love. I love it. It's an invitation to commit. It's brilliant. Fantastic. Um, and I have no idea why I stood up. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. You've got so much passion. So can you make some short films with these guys? I, I think... Get I, this I, out there? I, I, there's a, um, we're developing a thing called Sustain Extreme, which is so in parallel. It's a, it's a website called Sustain Extreme. And it's, it's extreme, solution, extreme Solutions for Sustainability. And it's, it's, it's entirely parallel. Um, uh, and I think that we need to talk. Yeah. And we're about media. We, we just look, we're basically, it's an a affiliate marketing situation. We say, sell a product, we'll take the money, and make movies. We don't. We we're just. We just want our day, day rates. I've made them. Uh, this is this is what we do now. So we should team up and do something. But you know, Sierra Club. Sierra Club. You guys were nice to us. 
on the river film. We, did, we, we met with you guys, we showed the film, you helped, you were there. But there, I think there's a generational problem here. We've got to get over it. We've got to get over it. Got to get over it. Got to get over it. So let's, um, let's talk about um, drinks. <laughs> what's next? How do we continue to come together? So I'm program chair for the East Bay Sierra Club dinners. My dad was program chair for the dinners for over 20 years, going back to the 70s. And um, when I took over the role, I said, look, love the dinners, love the format, but what I think we need to do is we need to get back to our roots as an environmental organization. The Sierra Club dinners traditionally over the past few decades, I sometimes cynically call it happy motoring, right? Somebody takes a trip somewhere, you know, in a, in a, using internal combustion engines, jet planes, cars, trains, whatever, and they take a bunch of pictures and they come and they give a slideshow. And it's great. It's beautiful. That's a great part of life. But we're the Sierra Club. If we don't come together and grapple with what do we need to do to save life on Earth, who do we expect to do it? NASCAR? The KKK? And we've got this wonderful format. So that's why I, we kicked off the John Muir series. This is the second of three dinners. Now we can make this perpetual if there's enough interest. You see, online meetings are great, but there's nothing like in person, right? Where we get to break bread together, have a meal, talk, and then talk late into the night like we're doing now. We'll probably be here until 11. And really explore this, right? So how many of you all are in favor of this being an ongoing thing where we get together once a month, you know? Maybe you can't make it every month, but this be an ongoing venue for this kind of conversation. How many are in favor of that? Great. Can you take answers? We can, we, 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 yeah, we can take questions from the internet. In fact, they're often posted. We've got 40 people viewing right now online that we're live, live streaming this, and then we'll publish an edited version, which will be a lot better quality. And that's part of what, that's why we're building Radish.org, so we can take questions and input from the internet and, and um, create a, you know, a big global community that doesn't just have one meeting like this, but a whole bunch of meetings on a whole bunch of different topics. Because again, it's going to take solutions across myriad realms. Political solutions, cultural solutions, media solutions, um, nuclear solutions, Arctic ice solutions, cleaning up the ocean solutions, coral reef solutions. We need so many solutions. Right? It's like we need to come up with I think a typical automobile has something like 15,000 parts. We need 15,000 teams working on the 15,000 parts that it's going to take to create the machinery of transformation. Right? How many times do you hear, oh, if only they got Trump out of office, then we could do this and this and this. Well, yeah, that's one solution. <laughs> but, you know, I guarantee you, if we had Hillary in office instead of Trump, fundamentally, things would be not a lot better. We'd still be careening over the edge, right, of the cliff, um, headed towards extinction. We had gore. War. The the gore. The last gore. Time, the last time they stole the election, you could have had gore. And yeah. That, if, that would have might have taken things. The, yeah, gore over W would have, would have been a radical change. We would have gone on a radically different path, I believe. And I'm deeply disappointed in the, all of us, myself included, why the heck didn't we stand up and do something about that um, at the time? So, um, you know, I remember at that time, you know, my, you know, when you know the Supreme Court had, had caved in and, and W was 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 taking office. You know, I said to my dad, you know, how how, how could this be? You know, you know, isn't anyone doing it? Well, there, there's a, there's a group in Marin County that's getting together and talking about this, and I said, well, great. You know, at least that's something. Right? What came of that? We need to take this beginning and turn it into a global movement. Now, how are we going to do that? Let's keep 
Yes, sir. In part, that man, right? You're the guest. You're the subject. I need to know a lot more about what you have to say. I mean, I, we've only scratched the surface. I mean, I, we need to Actually, know. Actually, okay, please tell me the right. No, we, uh, my no, voice projects. No, no, no. We, we need you on the tape. On the no, recording. no. I, I, but really, I, I need to. I need to know what what you have to say. I mean, I think you have extraordinary depth. And uh, I don't think we're getting it. I think that a situation like this requires uh, even more a, a chance to really address you. So what I'd like to see is files, things you've written. I want, a, I want a whole a series of things so I can read them all and understand what you have to say. Because I, I felt what you had to say was great, was, was wise. Um, but on the solution side, on the solutionary side, I need more. I need more. I, need, I, don't, I don't know if if what we just heard tonight was sufficient, at least not for my taste. I just need to know more. So, so stay with the microphone, at least, please, until someone else comes. But um, have, have you seen some of Guy's presentations? Uh, no, I, mean, I have to say, uh, Jim McGreen over here, uh, I, I, I've done a little film work with him, and uh, my, I study the broad realm of uh, what we're talking about here. Like, you mean, like, like, like an idiot. You know, I'm, okay. just, I'm just obsessed with it. So I need to know more about, um, I need to know what he knows that we need to know that maybe we can't find in an article. But we, I need him to, to address, he needs to be really hosting a discussion that goes deeper. Normally I, I, he does. Well, normally he does. He does. Yeah, so, but I know this is a general well, situation and yeah. you, know, you have the dirty dozen and we need to go further. So. Yeah, so I, I missed that. I'm sorry. I, forgive me. I, I, no, I'm okay. missing, missing that point. But, uh, and he's been giving presentations for yeah, several years. Yeah. And so we decided this week what he would do is have a conversation. Well, I, I, I appreciate the salad, but I like the second yeah, course. Good. Uh, but, uh, no, but, uh, so, so we've got 14 books. Have you said you've written 14 books on this topic? Yes, I, I So there you go. You got to I drove four and a half hours to get here. And Thank I, you. And I appreciate every minute of it, every comment. And if we keep doing this, I'll keep coming if I can. And right now, I'd like to make a very practical suggestion. I don't know if anybody else feels this, but the energy is dissipating in the room. And I think, I mean, I, would, I will stay here until the last person runs out of stuff to say. But I think the rest of the conversation would benefit a great deal if we brought the circle back together. We could also stop fighting over the microphone. <laughs> yeah, why, why, why don't we all, let, let's do that. That's a great idea. What if we had an event in a public place that's accessible to all, like in a park or a, a square downtown where, I don't know if there's a stage or not, but where people can, passers-by can join in, you know, so it's yeah. maybe not just invitees, but that we get the general public involved as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Bay area, all the other chapters are just here. If you don't mind, thank you. Okay, we're going to skip the mic. But just the whole Bay area, like, you know, spend enough time so we can publicize it and get the other Sierra Club chapters involved and educate them. Like, I really think what you did last, Time was so enlightening, and it really, you know, and then if we could develop a piece, just a simple piece, like a three page piece that's got some graphics to just tell the story succinctly that we could get out, you know. Mini that, flyers. Yeah, mini flyers. Mini yeah, books. here's the issue, you know. But. Do, do you have any of those flyers, Julia, the color ones? Mm -hmm. I just want to pass that around. So let, let me just talk about one of the other activities that I do. Speaking of public stuff, is um, I dress up as Darth Vader with like a full Darth Vader costume, uh, flashing lights and everything. And I have a giant sign, which I'll show. First, let me just show the camera. It shows the Death Star, you know, with its giant laser beam trained on Mother Earth. I'll just pass it around. And the Death Star is starting to destroy Mother Earth. And on the Death Star, it says, Abrupt Climate Change in big block letters. And at the bottom of this, this is a giant sign, three feet wide, four feet tall on a 10-foot pole. 
So there I am, this Darth Vader with this giant sign. At the bottom of the sign it says, which side are you on? Right? In the side of the Death Star of Destruction or of Mother Earth that's being destroyed. And I sing. So I have a microphone. I have two amplification systems, one for the background music and one for my voice. And I sing songs. I sing Spanish love songs. I've done this a full day at UC Berkeley, a full day at Stanford, a full day in downtown San Francisco, and the response is very positive. Um, it's also a bit draining, <laughs> but uh, I love doing it. Um, and I think we need to find more creative ways to reach out and invite other people to the conversation. And uh, Sierra Club dinners, public events, online forums. Street theater, Street theater. Yeah. mural painting, mural paintings. Um, Get classes involved. Three teachers. Yeah. So I encourage everyone. So you know, a monthly meeting is one thing, and you know, sometimes you can make it. And I sure appreciate those who have come, have traveled great distances. Last time we had people flying all the way out from the Midwest uh, to join. Um, our friends from Santa Cruz. Adolfo and Julia drove up from Santa Cruz, as, as did Peter. Um, so people are coming from, from far around. I think, I think this, is, this has great potential, right? Like I said, it's a bit messy, right? We don't, we don't know what we're doing here. We don't know how we're going to get from here to where we're going. We don't even know where we're going or what our target should be. We talk about shutting down nuclear. We're all going to die, so let's shut down nuclear. One of the issues I have with that message is it's not very inspiring, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, ooh, what a downer. It's like, we really screwed up, so let's you know, mitigate some of the damage before we all die, right? And um, so I, I just really wonder, is that gonna carry the day? Do we need to set our sights higher and broader for some bigger goal, uh, like saving all of life on Earth, including human life, right? People wanna survive. So, um, I mean, it may not be very practical, but, uh, the Earth would be better without us. But the, the Earth may be better without us, but you see, here's the thing. Let, let's say if right now we flipped a switch and all, all humanity just died, right? The nuclear power plants would all go to Fukushima, right? And we ionize the atmosphere. We end up with a, with a, a dry, hot, radioactive, atmosphere-free, lifeless rock, another Mars or Venus, right? So we, it's not time for us to check out quite yet, right? At a minimum, let's shut down the nuclear power plants. But to do that effectively, A, we need time, and B, we need mobilization. We need materials, we need concrete, we need expertise. So how do we get all that mobilized? How do we buy time and how do we mobilize people? Well, how do we buy time? We gotta refreeze the Arctic. Well, how are we gonna do that? We gotta figure that out. How are we gonna mobilize people? That's what we're figuring out right now, pardon me? You gotta mobilize the people first. You gotta mobilize people Bring first. Bring them to the awareness so that they're motivated to be a part of the solution. Yeah. Right. But first, that you have to clear out the stupor and clear out the toxicity. This is just a huge uh, undertaking. So I think that what we need is more of the people like we have right here in this room right now. You notice there were a couple times as many of us an hour and a half ago. <clears throat> And little by little, some of those people would be kind of like, oh, this is a downer, and they leave, right? They just get tired. They get tired, or, you know, where's the, where, where, where's the candy, right? <laughs> you know, where's the feel good, right? So um, we need people like us who are willing to stay in the conversation and stick with it, no matter how ugly it looks, no matter how bleak it looks. Look to your left, look to your right. You're looking at leaders. You're looking at pioneers. You're looking at people who are willing to stare the abyss in the face and say, fuck you, right? We're gonna, we're, we can do better than this, right? So it starts with us. Oh, oh please, please, Greg. I, I, I appreciate it, thank you. And, and this is a downer question, kind of, because on the subject of fear, I think people are afraid because they see what happens to people who stand up. Mm. I mean, and even when somebody burns themselves to death, what happens? What, what is the result of that? Um, 
but you've, you've seen people on TV being dragged out of, you know, um, meetings and off planes, and I mean, we live in a police state. Yeah. So it seems to me that the only way is to have um, street theater, because they can't really arrest yeah. you for that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they can. And buddy systems. Everybody needs a buddy, someone that they can really turn to for support, helping. Um. <clears throat> Thanks, Jimmy. I, I just think that because it does require a certain uh, solidity and fortification of will and of courage, we need buddy systems. We need to not feel like we're alone. We need to actually connect with people that will be through the time we have ahead, there when we need to say, hey, I really, let's talk, you know. I, I'm feeling alone with all this yeah. knowledge. So I think buddy systems are very important. Sometimes we can't even talk with our own families about these hard truths. Yeah. Um, in the last meeting we were here, there was a gentleman who was speaking in, in detail about his feelings. Do you remember the guy who was sitting sort of right here and he's like, hey, I, I got really concerned for my family. I put together this whole slide presentation. I got them all together. I sat them down, and I'm like, look, this is what's happening, da 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 And they were like, uh, yeah, well, all right, Dad, can we go now? And he, at that point, just was like, you know, what do I do now? And you can tell me that this is happening to the elephants, and this is happening to the lions, and this is happening to the rhinos, and this is happening to the grasslands, and this is happening to the rivers, and the plastic in the ocean. Okay, well, that's happening, but all, all I really care about is my family, and if it's going to affect my family. But then, he couldn't get his family to engage on any of it. So, what I think is really important is that we each, and everyone you know who really does care about this and want to be involved in navigating hopefully away from the worst case scenario and, and saving as much of the beauty, the life, the potential, the ecosystems as we possibly can. We, we do need to support each other in new ways with love and compassion toward ourselves and toward each other and buddy systems. Uh, you first. You first. Oh, thanks. Um, I think Guy McPherson is a doctor. And uh, he, and uh, like he says, uh, uh, if you have cancer, the doctor is obligated to tell you. If, if you're going to die in a few weeks or something, he's obligated to tell you. And, and Dr. McPherson is also a realist. So he's coming on, he's telling us the way he sees it. And, and he sees it probably better than any of us. He is real courageous. Yes, very, very courageous man. And I, you know, my, I applaud you. And, um, but I'm, I also agree with, with Jamie that, that I think we need to aim high or uh, use the shotgun blast, you know, uh, because if we just aim for for uh, putting away nuclear power plants because we're all going to die anyway, um, you're going to have a lot of people just fall out. I mean, they're not, they're, well, I'm going to die. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go home. You know, so so I I think what we really need is a plan. I mean, so like say if. Dr. McPherson gets together with uh, Paul uh, Beckwith and, and, and uh, Jim uh, Wadhams, and um, maybe they form a team. And they come up with a, a list of solutions, a hypothetical list that, that, that disregards all the problem, all the, the reasons why we can't do this. Even, even to the point where uh, it, something we haven't invented yet. Like, I've heard, I've heard a lot of talk about global dimming. I haven't heard any solutions for global dimming yet. So, a, we, with, without a plan for a way out, we're lost. We're all going in different directions. Yes. So, um, and I think, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to hear from, 
uh, Guy McPherson on this because I think we need, I mean, once you, if you put a team together like this and give us the solution, what we would have to do to, to get out of it, at least then we'd have a guide. And we, you know, without that, we're just lost. That's what I think. Yes. Everybody does. All species go extinct. More than 99% of the species that have existed on this planet are now extinct. Half a dozen species of our genus, Homo, are extinct. We think we're so unbelievably special that we will never go extinct. That we have to somehow forestall our own extinction. We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on planet Earth. We're in the midst of abrupt climate change. That's not a solution. There is no solution. There is no more forestalling human extinction. You're all going to die. Our species is going to go extinct. It will happen in the very near future, both of those. We cannot live on this planet with an ice-free Arctic. What to do? Live. Try to clean up our mess before we leave the planetary stage. Yes. That's what I'm suggesting. That's what I've been suggesting all night. The man is suggesting. Asking you for a plan. What's the Give plan? Some, the plan a is to... A 12-step program. Okay. Step one. Get a bunch of really talented people. Ignore the media. They're not going to report this ever. There's no money in extinction. Make them. We can't make them. We will make them. You, you want the 12-step plan from me or do you want to take it over from here? No, no, I'm sorry. We get the few people who are willing to come together, to come up with the money, and it's not a lot, to buy the land adjacent to the nuclear power facilities on Earth. There's not that many of them. We need to put in place the infrastructure so that when civilization collapses, and it's coming way sooner than anybody in this room except me thinks, maybe probably, so that when civilization collapses, we will have people there willing to take the existing infrastructure and create Chernobyl at each, at each one of those places instead of Fukushima. Plans one and two, then we're all dead. End of story. We don't even need those extra ten steps. Aren't I a lot of fun? Don't keep the, the time is now. The time is now. The time to live fully is now. We don't have long our species will not persist in the face of an ice-free Arctic, period, end of story. That ice-free Arctic is projected to occur in 2016 plus or minus three years. It's coming soon. We won't be around much longer, folks. You gonna clean up the mess we made on our way out the door? That's the point of tonight. I would like to see that happen. I don't know how to make that happen. I'm a conservation biologist with a few hundred dollars. I don't have the money, I don't have the intellect, I don't have access to the material. I can't make this happen. That's why we're meeting with all of you. What, what about radical sequestration? The question was, what about radical sequestration? Won't even make a dent. Sequestration of carbon dioxide at this point it, it won't even it won't even make a dent in the interest, much less the principle. I understand there's a, a process where uh, we can pull carbon and, and no, I'm sorry. The United States National Academy of Sciences in 2015, and within a few weeks, a European body of similar stature concluded that geoengineering will not help concluded that carbon sequestration cannot be done. This is 2015. The United States National Academy of Sciences 
is not a liberal left-wing organization. This is a conservative body concluding that the kinds of things you're suggesting will not But work. I understand there's a, a process which exists where uh, someone has suggested we can pull um, carbon from the air and make materials out of it using nanotechnology. Is that uh, a con an idea that... There's a lot of ideas. I, I worked for, in Silicon Valley for 30 years. I saw amazing things happen. I mean, it seemed that every three weeks they were making something that just was appallingly wonderful. Uh, I mean, if, if, if the idea that we could take a vast amount of carbon out of the air and make materials out of it? I mean, is that, is that just a crazy idea or is that like Star Trek? That's Star Trek and beyond. Okay. If we could do that, we'd be doing that yesterday. But there is something... Do you not think that the people who pull the strings of empire know what I know? Do you not think they would use all of the money they could possibly not print to make that happen? Of course they would. I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, of I, course they would. Do you think they want to die? Do you think they want our species to go extinct? So, do you think they can force all the six mass extinction by, by so you're saying this is sucking a, essentially an end, end end of point here? We should pretty much pull out the party hats now. No. I am not now, nor have I ever suggested increased hedonism among Americans as if that could ever well, like, I, fucking I, happen. I, mean, I, I have I, never proposed that as I, a response. As an, op as an option, I'm sorry. Uh, as an option, I think it might be a possibility, uh, but uh, I, I, I still think there needs to be some degree of, I mean, there has to be hope. I mean, even if Does you're having your last drink. Does there? Um, yeah, there has to be. There has to be hope, really? Did you see the movie? What was it called? Mad Max. Oh, yeah. The latest Mad Max movie? I'm a filmmaker, this is, so I guess I'm familiar with this. This, I, this, I watch this, almost no movies. This I've, tripe. I've seen 40 this movies in the last 40 it's tripe, years. It's tripe, it's tripe, it's Hollywood. But the, but the best scene has the protagonist saying, hope is a mistake. If you can't fix what's broken, you'll go insane. And we can't fix this. And so, you continuing to believe against all evidence that we can fix this is going to drive you crazy. So, There's no fixing this. There's no fixing this. We are going to die. We are going to go extinct. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. All the hope in the world, all the belief in the world, all the faith in the world will not save you. If you continue to believe that's the case, you're going to go crazier than you already are. And I can tell you're crazy because you're in this room with 21 other people. <laughs> in the middle of the goddamn night talking about shit that is never going to happen. You went crazy? It starts here, and it's spread to all of you. <laughs> Apparently on flight paper for freaks. If we were to turn, we were to, turn to you and say that you're crazy, uh, maybe we would not number you. I just admitted I'm the craziest person in the room. Uh, what more okay. do you want? Then we have an argument. Okay, I love it. Can I ask I a question, it. please? I'm crazy. If this is what's going to happen, and I, I, I have to say I probably in my gut agree with you, even though I'm not a scientist or anything like that. It just makes a lot of sense. But is it not true that there's a lot of between here and there? I mean, between here and extinction, there's going to be a horrible mess. When our, when our economy starts to collapse, and when this starts to get realized, like our whole economic system, the selfishness of, the, of mankind will come out. There'll be all sorts of horrible things happening. And so all of a sudden, you know, providing the, the resources to shut down the nuclear power plants will probably be the last thing that people will start thinking about. They're going to start thinking about their own survival or asking for pills. Can you give me the pill I can take to commit suicide because I can't provide and live the capitalist life that I've been, you know, deluded to leave my whole life and bring my kids up in. And like, how are we all going to face this? Like, are people planning for this? Are there people, if we're not putting our time and energy into trying to figure out a, a solution for, for a situation where there is no solution, should we not be then trying to put together a plan for how we can, in an orderly manner, not just the nuclear power plants, but how can we plan for the death of all of us? How's it going to happen? Like the, like the banking system, the stock market's going to collapse, and then we won't, we won't have, uh, how, only the people who have money. Can you imagine all these people are going to, that they're probably only planning that they're I've been imagining it for 16 years. Well, okay. You think this is new to me? No, 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 but I know, but... I've spelled it out thousands of times in hundreds of formats how I think this is going to play out. 
you give a little recap or no? Or we'll pick one of your books. Which one should we read? GuyMcPherson.com. Okay, it's all there's, there's thousands of okay. tidbits there. How's it going to play out? Badly. It's going to be ugly. Yeah. On the other hand, we're going to see the best, the best behaviors of human beings come out. Mm -hmm. Our behaviors will undoubtedly be exacerbated. Evil people will become more evil. Good people will become better. Compassionate people will become more compassionate. People will throw themselves into the brink to stop nuclear power plants from killing all life on Earth. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly in that group because I know that I'm going to die. I'm stunned I'm still alive. I'm stunned we didn't have an ice free arctic last year that caused my death. I'm living on borrowed time. I'm perfectly willing to throw my body onto a nuclear power plant on the point zero 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 one percent chance that it might make a difference for a microbe in the future. And I suspect other people are equally willing. I have no hope. There is no hope. And yet, in light of that, in light of the fact that I'm going to die and our species is going to go extinct, I am willing, and because, in fact, not in spite of, but because of knowing this, I'm willing to sacrifice my life for the potential for microbial life on Earth a hundred years from now. It's going to happen anyway. What's going to happen anyway? Uh, microbial life will survive. Why? I mean, I mean, How? What's going to With happen? no atmosphere on Earth, we become Mars? There's no life on Mars, by yeah, the way. So, uh, this will continue. I mean, <laughs> is, this, is this, I mean, I... Uh, this is, With this what is, evidence this do you is, suggest that this, this is, will I, continue I mean, in any way? You're an environmental nihilist. I mean, you're a nihilist. I mean, uh, what kind of, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm science lost. Science is a nuclear power plant. I'm science. lost. I'm, I'm really lost, lost in this. How the science works. It has nothing but to do with our science? emotions. But what science? I mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 I religiously study science building. all the time as, as a, 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 just a, a citizen. Period. I do. Science. I mean, but you're, th this is a sense, we all know it's going to die. It's all going to go away. Yeah. But we do have some control over what's left. And that's terribly important to us. That's exactly what I've been saying all night. We do have, some, we might have some control but over this picture, not becoming Mars. Well, then give, but, but give us some. Support. I already did. I gave you the two-step program. You want more. Yes, you want the insurance. You want insurance that you're going to live a long time, have you, lots of privilege, and that your kids will live forever. I want you to work harder for us. I've been working for free for you for nine years. Not for me. Not for me. I mean, really. I mean, honestly. I mean, I, I mean. I've been working for nine years for free for well, planet I've done Earth, the for same. life on Earth. Look. Don't accuse me look, of not working hard enough. I, 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 I've made films. I've done things about the environment which are, have had significant effect. This isn't a competition here. I'm basically saying, why dispel hope? We do have some chance. Hope we is can, a mistake. No, if you no. can't fix we can broken, do things. It'll drive you insane. We can do things. We can do things. So, I mean, uh, give me a We second. can do things, and I've indicated what kinds of things we can do. We cannot prevent our deaths. We cannot prevent our extinction. I think, I think you underestimate massively. I really do. And I leave it at that. Um, We're getting close to discovering the elephant in the room. Thank you. The elephant in the room that I've been watching, I've been following a guy for a number of years. The elephant in the room in this conversation is once we talk about extinction or massive disasters, what we're really talking about but never saying so is my death, your death, yours, 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 yours. Guy has dealt with that in his own way. In my humble opinion, it could be expressed better. Guy, I have a book for you. Now, the problem with this topic is 
that it is much larger than extinction and all the solutions that we might be thinking about. One of the problems is that we are fascinated in, with a certain cliché, you've got to give people hope. Hope. Yes. Hope is a very treacherous subject. The reason is that we humans are not very good at distinguishing between wishful thinking, which is another way word, word for hope, and reality. So we always need hope because we, we think we can tweak reality. My humble opinion about the situation we're in, and I'm not very fascinated with mechanical and technological solutions for this reason. The situation we're in, including climate change, including financial hocus pocus and what you name it, as I see it, the mo this moment is the result of the byproduct of 10,000 years of problem solving. We are really good at solving problems in, within limited environments. We, we've gotten brilliant at that in the last 200 years. And it's very easy to get carried away with that and think, oh, we can solve it all. On that score, for those who want hope, there's going to be a conference in San Francisco in August by the uh, Singularity University. They think by, 1920, by 2029, machines will do everything that we normally do. So if you want hope, that's one place you can get a lot of hope. Um, personally, I've, I've spent 25 years in the Bay Area up to my ears in hospice work. So what I saw happening here a minute ago was a family argue, getting into arguments that had nothing to do with what they were coming together for. What happens is when a family is around a dying person, all kinds of personal shit comes to the surface. That's what started happening in the And I'm not pointing any fingers at any, anybody's shit. That's just us, we humans. That's how we operate. So, personally, when it comes to hope, I don't have a whole lot of hope for solutions unless, I mean, in, in order for us to have the same conversation on this, we really have to go to a death and dying seminar first and get to a slightly more peaceful place with our own death. Because until we do that, we will grasp at all kinds of hopes and solutions and fantasies how we can cheat our way out of this. Do you have grandchildren? No. I guess that's obvious. No. Well, that's okay. terrible. No, I'll, 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 I'll respond to that. There is a uh, one of Guy's buddies is Paul Beckwith in uh, Canada. Somebody has pointed out the difference between Paul Beckwith and Guy is three children. I'm aware that it's, there's a difference having this conversation with people who are parents and grandparents and people who aren't. That's, that's a fact of life. But this is all part of the dynamic that gets into this kind of a circle when we start talking about extinction. It gets very personal. And until we can acknowledge that, we're in trouble. The reason I know this is, and I don't want to get too far off on this tangent, I had a very earth-shaking experience around my father's death about 35 years ago, which, and this is a very personal thing, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't do any good to tell you the story, but for me, what happened at that moment was that I became infinitely more comfortable with my own death, and I instantly saw the connection between my concern for environmental disaster and my fear of death. And I'll leave it at that. Reflect on that. This is not something we can solve in, in one or two sound bites. But 
from, as far as I can tell, you cannot have a sane conversation about extinction until you're, you've done some work with your relationship with your death. Um, this gentleman hasn't spoken at all. Yeah, I have a very quick, quick comment. If I may be so presumptuous as to summarize Guy's massive body of work in four words, it is, we're out of time. That's it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I can... Uh, but... Um, I don't want to. I don't want the last five minutes of my life um, to be in regret that I didn't do everything that I could possibly do. And um, man goes to the doctor, and the doctor tells him he's terminally ill, and he's he's got cancer. And he's gonna die. So he says, all he can do is prepare to die. So man goes home and he prepares to die. And then he hears, you know, but the doctor, the doctor knows a lot, a lot, there's no doubt. Um, but he doesn't know everything. And, uh, and mankind hasn't tried, we haven't really tried yet. And so, so the man, uh, terminally ill man, um, finds out about um, a, a, a healer woman that heals uh, cancers with um, macrobiotic diet and, and um, things like that. So he goes to the woman and, and she, she writes, she spends some time talking to him and she writes down a list. And she says, okay, if you follow these procedures, as hard as they are, then you might, and, the, and the earth, Mother Earth smiles down on you. Might be able to get out of this. And um, now I know that um, that would breed hope, um, but we need experts to give us a way out. And that's why that's why I want that's why I'm encouraged about radical collective intelligence because. You know, it, it gives us a place to go to, and at least exercise our, you know, what, what, what we can do, you know, to, to get out of this. Um, I don't want to just throw up my arms and, 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 and give up. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I, I just wanted to say something to the circle. Um, so, um, I'm not mocking you, so you don't need to mock me, okay? I, I might speak a different language than you, but I'm being respectful to you, so I ask the same for you. No, I, 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 and I, I, um, I, I want to say that we don't need to shoot the messenger. That's no, the first I, thing I want to say. Sorry, just let me speak, and then I'll pass the mic to you. Um, Guy, Guy is a professional. He spent his whole life studying what he studied and he's delivering a message to us you can believe it or not believe it that's up to everybody in this room and beyond if they want to believe that um, my own way of dealing with it the, I'm, I'm an intuitive person so I don't ha I don't have to prove this stuff I feel it and I think a lot of people do feel it um, and some feel it by watching, observing nature. You can see that there, things are dwindling. There are fewer butterflies around, fewer bees. I don't need to go and do a scientific formula for that. I use my senses and I can see it. Um, and my way of dealing with this is non-attachment. And we're all gonna die anyway. I mean, that's, we're born and we live and then we die. So, you know, um, it, it, the, I, the concept of extinction is a strange one. I'm kind of, personally, I'm kind of fascinated by it because I know that there's been extinctions before, but it's pretty, 
fucking amazing that all of us have chosen to be here to witness this and to participate in this. And personally, I just ask questions about that. Why, you know, and what is the meaning of this? And what I, I like about what Jamin and Guy are doing and proposing is that we stop being so homocentric and become earth-centric because we sure got off that track. And if we put Mother Earth here and ourselves around her, then we will take right action to not care so much about ourselves, but to care about her and the other living beings on this earth, which we have turned our backs on and we have not protected and we have not taken care of. And shame on us. Shame on us. How many hundreds of years have we turned our back on Mother Earth? White male ruling this planet. That's what has got us into this shit to begin with. I'm going to call it on the patriarchy because this has got us in this mess. But we're not going to get out of it. So practice non-attachment. And it's really hard to do. But you can do it. And then what we can do is by being Mother Earth-centric, Gaia-centric, is we can do what we can do to make sure we put the campfire out before we're gone. Whether it's a natural death, you might die tomorrow by, I hope you don't, but you might die by getting hit by a car or your plane might crash. Any one of us. You know, we don't know, but, but we can spend every last moment of life on this earth and every last breath trying to do something that will maybe, if there is a chance, of preserving some form of life on this earth after we're gone, if we're gone. Well, how about what happens to the rest of us after we're gone? The rest of us. I, I don't understand what you said. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not, I don't understand what you just said. Can I just you don't understand. I, I'm not expecting you to understand, but um, and I'm saying that respectfully, um, and that's okay. I mean, I just think that's your journey, and um, maybe you want to investigate a little bit about Buddhism. I have. Okay. I have. I mean, I, I'm a generalist. So you should. Most of the stuff you're okay. talking about. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, well, that's I, okay. I, I, I have to say this. In terms yes. of what we're facing, yeah. Yeah. what we're facing, uh, it's my truth. I mean, I swear. If I may, yeah, yeah. just a okay. moment. Um, excuse me, brother. I really appreciate what you said and what you spoke to. Really deeply. Um, I agree with you that until we really come to terms with what it looks like is coming down the pike, you know, based in science, based in the math, until we really come to terms with that thing that our culture has such difficulty with, my goodness, aging and dying. It's all either part of let's cover it up and change it and not age and fix it and facelift it and doctor it and sew it up and stitch it under and make it up out and yeah, 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 on and on. Or, or, you know, finally, thank God, there is hospice to help people in the process of crossing over. But death is really shrouded as a concept, generally, in this, in this society. Um, what I want to say is, Having met my own death many times, I do not fear death. And yet I know what I live for is the beauty, the majesty, the grace of nature and the natural world. That is what inspires me every day. And so while we need to acknowledge that we are on the edge of the abyss, and I believe this is right because I feel it in my bones and I felt it for a number of years coming on. And yes, I gave my life to teaching about nature and science and ecology and helping people as a natural health practitioner. That's how I spent my life. And yet, 
to what avail? I was a rebel, outsider, whatever. Um, the fact is, we are where we are. The way we live each moment of every day, the ground of being that we stand upon, our ethical ground of being, our moral, ethical conduct, the heart-centered, but also truthful, you know, I'm not saying sugar la-la to every this and that, you know. Love, sometimes love is tough love. It's saying, hey, don't bullshit me, come on, let's be real. That's love, sometimes that's real love. But I, I feel that for, for those who seek a plan to come from outside themselves, Religion was developed for that, but, you know, the truth is, the truth is within you. And it comes from your relationship with whatever your higher power is or whatever it is that you love. And it emanates from the core and maybe it radiates from the mountaintops or across the waves. Or, but it's time to find your place of peace, make peace with yourself, make peace with your loved ones. Don't look for someone else to make a list. Choose what you care about. Choose what you can do now in this world, in this life, to unite the people toward consciousness, toward ethical, um, caring, moral choices. Choose, choose, choose your list of priorities. And keep on standing up for what you believe in, because really, you have to live, we all have to live with ourselves. In that final moment, you do want to be sure that you've just lived fully the integrity that, that you want to have lived with. Okay, that's all I want to say. I'd like to respond to what Melissa said um, and about being in touch with the earth. Uh, when, when mankind lived as hunters and gatherers, uh, you know, uh, we, at some point, we made a mistake and we started uh, planting and herding. And uh, that caused population overshoot, as Guy McPherson refers to. We started herding animals. And so we, instead of being hunters and gatherers and, and going out and killing an animal sacredly, and burying the heart, you know, uh, along with the animal, or they would do that. Um, they, the hunters and gatherers had a great deal of respect for nature. And, um, but when we started herding animals, we, I mean, think about it, we would herd them, and we would become friends with them, and then we would kill them and eat them. When we did that, Something happened to our psyche because you you can't you can't become friends with somebody and then eat it. It it it's a contradiction of the, of the way we were born. And you, so today we we are so separated from reality. I mean, we go to the store and we buy meat, and and I'm just as guilty as anybody else. But we, we don't, we think about the price. We think about if it's in the resealable package, how, what the expiration date on it is. We don't give one thought for the life that was, you know, many, you know, so, sure, so many people do. It's to rethink your way of relating to the food that you eat. Yeah, right. So I guess the, the point I'm trying to, to make is that we, the, the animals, the, this caused a crossover in our brain, in our brains, and, and, and animals were the first form of money. And so I, I really think that we're all poisoned today. And, and I think that we've been under the influence of this poison for so long that, uh, and we've been fighting uh, global warming since 1970 when the first Earth Day was, came about. And we've been losing the battle because we're all we're all op operating under the influence of this poison. 
And so this is why I think if we get rid of the poison, it's like out. It's just like alcoholics not. You can't. You can't just. You can't keep using alcohol. You have to quit completely. And um, and once once you quit, then you start to realize that all these crazy things you did was because you were under the influence of a poison. And I think that's that's why we do all the crazy things we do is because we're under the influence of a poison. And if we can get rid of that poison, um, who knows what we could do? I mean, we have imaginations. We have computers. There's there's things that might we might be able to do. I'm I'm not. I I love Guy McPherson. I think he's awesome, and I appreciate that he's 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 bringing this to our attention. But but it's time for us to wake up, and 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 start putting our heads together and figuring out how we can get out of this mess. And, and I, I, for one, I don't want to throw up my arms and give up. I want to go talk to the, the natives. I, I want to, I want to um, talk to the whole world. I, I, want to, I want to give up our money and, and get rid of the poison. Because I think when we get rid of the poison, well, our, our minds will clear and we'll be able to see what you know, and, and, I've, and I've written a, a manuscript on this, and it, it, is, it could be a much better way of life. It really could. I mean, you could start out with a, with a volunteer work, work system, workforce. If you take the 40-hour work week, typical 40-hour work week, and you, you re remove money, the, the part that that's deals with money, you're going to reduce that work week down a whole bunch. And then, if you don't have money, you don't have to advertise. You don't, you don't have to make all these thousands of choices. Anyway, I calculated it out uh, several different ways, and I came out that you could reduce that work hour week down to 15 hours. If you could reduce the work hour week down to 15 hours, you could get using automation and computers. You could get a volunteer workforce going, and and then we could start thinking clearly. If if money's not in the way. We can we can use our whatever resources we have to come together. And I just want to say that before I begin. Thanks. I'm just going to talk for a minute, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jamin to wrap it up. First, I need to clear up a couple of misconceptions. I have never promoted the idea of inaction, whatever that means. I've taken actions far more radical than anybody in this room could ever possibly imagine. I abandoned the monetary system nine years ago voluntarily. Not a single person followed. Not one. I lived off-grid for the last decade. Almost nobody followed. Then I discovered the extreme nature of global dimming and realize that none of that matters. Second point is with regard to the cheap shot from the gentleman who subsequently left about having children or not, about being unable to come to grips with the situation if you don't have children. Well, the reason I don't have children as a conscious choice is because I could see what was coming when I was 19 years old who couldn't. You know when you're a teenager what you've all forgotten since then. That no significant problem can be improved by adding more people to the mix. And what a horrible thing to say. This woman beside me, who understands my message better than anybody else on earth besides me, has three children, the youngest of whom turned 21 years a couple of weeks ago. And, and you think she's lesser or more because of that, because she has children? You think she understands more deeply or less deeply the situation we're in because she has children? That's absurd. And finally, and most importantly, I want to thank all of you for staying here and staying here this long and participating in the conversation that so few are willing to have. You are courageous people and now exhausted people. And thank you very much for hanging in here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Guy and Pauline, for making this trip. 
from so far away. <clears throat> and thank you all. Um, this is, I, I am really inspired by what we've accomplished here tonight. I don't know what the future holds, I don't know how long we have left, and I don't know what we're going to accomplish in that time, but to the extent we accomplish anything, it will be because of meetings like this one tonight. <clears throat> and I, for one, want this process to continue in four weeks, put it on your calendar, sign up, we will have the third and final uh, Chair Club dinner of the series, the John Muir series, Answering the Call of Life. Please come, please bring the best people you know, the people who you think can really contribute to this conversation. And thank you all for uh, signing up on the, for the email list. I will uh, email you information about upcoming events, whether online or in person. Um, you can opt out at any time. I'm not here to harass anyone or, or whatever. But um, uh, please feel free to res respond and let's engage. This is what I do. This is my life work at this point. It has been for the last few years and will be to my dying breath. Uh, bringing people together to form the radical collective intelligence and see what we can do, what's possible. So, onward, onward and downward, onward and upward, onward and flat. We don't know where we're going, but let's go there together. And let's get one more for the Gipper. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you all.